Hello again everyone and welcome back to the underground. So what if I were to tell you that a century old technology could actually be quite useful when it comes to navigating through the world of mass surveillance and censorship that we find ourselves living in today? The answer to that question is field telephones, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So a lot of people might be wondering why we're talking about a technology that is well over 100 years old and is in fact in museums in a lot of places, right? It's not very often that you want to, you know, surf eBay to find essentially what would be a museum relic and use that as one of your communications methods. Well, here's exactly why you might want to do just that. So we find ourselves at the end of 2020, moving into 2021. We find ourselves uh, moving into a new age of surveillance. And we're not talking just the typical, you know, governmental surveillance that everybody's become numb to now. We find ourselves moving into an era of corporate surveillance, you know, uh, you know f Facebook, Twitter, social media in general, spying on you, uh, not just for ads, but to see what you're thinking. And then if they don't like what you're thinking, they're going to censor what you're posting. So we've gotten a lot of messages from people uh, over the past few months, really since the election, of People who say, hey, look, you know, I don't post anything political on my Facebook page. I don't post anything political on Twitter. I don't like or follow anything remotely political. And yet my account was deleted based on political radicalism. You know, that doesn't make any sense. So one of the things that that is coming out and is becoming readily apparent is that social media and particularly a lot of these private companies are spying on people and censoring people far more um, accurately, far more personally than governmental forces could ever imagine. So one of the ways that we're trying to move forward in this new era is trying to figure out how to get around that. So one of the ways that we we tried uh, getting around it is with things like ham radio and you know peer-to-peer uh, -peer, you know uh, uh, decentralized social media and things like that things that we're actively working on but we also found another way and this method is uh, particularly useful in cases where you're trying to send a very short message from say your house to say your neighbor's house it's like either right next door or across the street or something like that if you're trying to send a short message that's you know maybe a sentence or two back and forth you know just to check up on things you know just say hey you know have you seen anything stuff like that if you have a short message like that you don't necessarily want to be beaming it out of your house right you don't want to necessarily necessarily be using it in with you know like either a ham radio which is in a lot of cases going to require a license and if it doesn't require a license it's still broadcasting an open signal throughout the airwaves right so anyone who's listening in can listen to what you're saying and you know you could you know use code words and things like that but that requires a lot of effort right and if we're going to be you know, try to branch out. We don't want to specialize so much on a lot of this technology. We want to be able to simplify it, right? To get more people on it. I would much rather have 10 people on my communications network that don't really know much about communications than to have one person on my communications network who's an expert, right? So keeping that in mind, we have a lot of criteria. And one of those criteria is to not use cloud type services because newsflash for everybody out there, there's no such thing as a cloud. It's all just a server on somebody else's property. So that's why we wanted to avoid things like, you know, texting. Texting can be picked up by a dirt box flying over a city. We don't want that. Um, you know, things like emails. Well, that's going through a server somewhere and I guarantee you it's not your server. Um, you know, things like secure messaging apps and things like that, like WhatsApp and Signal and Keybase, those are great and they are secure, but at the same time, they are they're they're totally reliant on the internet. So what if the internet goes down? What if the you know the particular app gets bought out by somebody else, right? So that's one of the huge considerations that we're trying to make sure that if we're going to invest in a system, it's gonna to have to be foolproof, right, to some certain degree. And in this particular 
example, which is what we're talking about, these small, short-range, point-to-point communications, a single uh, telephone wire, you know, stretched between two field telephones, one in your house, one in your neighbor's house, might actually be uh, fit the bill quite well. Um, the only vulnerabilities that come from the, the field telephone setup are the actual wire itself. So anybody who's on the wire or can tap into the wire can hear what you're saying. But if that wire is hidden to where no one can find it, You've got a pretty secure communication system, right? You know, even the best hackers in the world, even the best spy tools and things like that, they can't get your information if they can't find it, right? So if the wire is hidden pretty well, you're going to have a very secure communications plan. And moving on to the sort of criteria that we were looking at, we wanted the system to be analog. We didn't want a digital type system that is vulnerable to the normal things that digital systems are you know, vulnerable to. We wanted something that's very, you know, very caveman, very Barney style, very durable, very long lasting. And the systems on planet Earth that tend to be, to fit those bills are analog. They're not necessarily a digital type system. We have a plethora of digital type systems for communicating. Look, I mean, download our comm card. It's almost all digital communication systems. But the point is, is that we also wanted an analog method that is, uh, you know, fits these other criteria as well. So one of the other ways that we want, one of the other criteria we wanted was that it doesn't transmit any signal. We wanted nothing going through the air that could be listened to and heard by somebody because, you know, it, it's not like, you know, it, for most of us here, it's not like anybody's sitting out there with a scanner listening to our VHF radio traffic, right? No, there's not very many people, n- not very many governmental agencies even capable of doing that, much less doing it. But there are other people, and we don't want to be direction found by, you know, transmitting a short two second message to somebody else who's across the yard from us. You know, we don't want to do that. If we can avoid you you transmitting, right? We want to practice MCON emissions control, right? We don't want to emit anything if we don't have to. We also wanted the system to have very little power draw or preferably no power at all. So these sound powered telephones, the sound powered ones are, they don't require any batteries at all. They will work without any power whatsoever because they generate it themselves. Um, whereas most field telephones require at least a couple of batteries, um, which are good, but you know, we would prefer something that has that requires no power at all, and certainly nothing that plugs into a wall. If it plugs into a wall outlet, or requires a router to be turned on, or if it requires a cell tower to have power to it, that's a no-go. We didn't want that. We wanted to be able to create the infrastructure ourselves and use it because we know it's more reliable. We also, it's sort of a, this is a minor one, minor criteria, but we also wanted a system that is EMP slash CME, coronal mass ejection hardened. You know, I think as we've learned from recent, you know, sort of solar events that have come, you know, reignited a lot of the, you know, coronal mass ejection slash EMP vulnerabilities of our systems. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that we, I I can't quite speak intelligently on this because I'm not a scientist, but... I do believe that most scientists sort of agree that we're starting, we're beginning the start of another solar cycle. So we're going to start seeing a lot of more solar activity and things like that. So we wanted a system that is not just prepared for you know nuclear annihilation, right? We wanted something that is more hardened against something that's far more likely, like a coronal mass ejection, right? We we have learned that you know even though these events are rare. They can happen, and they can happen very, very quickly. So we wanted something that's naturally hardened against that. And the the field telephone system is naturally hardened against all sort of electromagnetic interference, right? It cannot be affected by electromagnetic interference, which is what we really wanted. We also wanted something that is completely impervious to jamming. Like you can jam all day long and it's not going to stop a field telephone. So, which is unlike things like Baofengs. You can jam someone with a Baofeng with another Baofeng, right? If you have a Baofeng and someone's transmitting on one watt and you crank your Baofeng up to five watts and transmit on the same frequency, and guess what you just did? You jammed them. So, we're starting to see that rioters and looters are starting to use handheld radios for communication, much like a lot of insurgent groups do uh, overseas. So, we're starting to see that, and um, we're starting to see people, 
you know, jam them by hot micing over them. So, of course, this is not really a huge concern for most people. There's only a couple of cases in the whole country of this happening. But it's a future. It's the future of what's going to happen. That's what we think. So we wanted something that is, if we're going to invest in something, we want to make sure that we don't have to retrofit it five years down the line when everybody and their cousin has a bow fang and they're jamming each other. We wanted something that is naturally impervious to it from the start. And then lastly, we also wanted something that is, the whole system had to be simple and cheap. And fortunately for us, uh, field telephones are the simplest form of technology out there in the world today, with the exception of maybe semaphore and Morse code. Um, they are very, uh, they're, they're the simplest form of, of relatively long distance um, voice communication out there. And they're really cheap. They're not as cheap as they used to be, but you can get into field telephones for quite cheap. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So a lot of people get turned off from the concept of sound powered telephones or field telephones because they think it's an ancient technology. They think it's, it, it's simply because it was around during World War II and even World War I. They think that because it was around during those times that it's now obsolete. That could not be further from the truth, right? Um, in fact, a, a lot of modern groups uh, have learned a lot the importance of having sound power telephones and no group out there has learned the importance of these field telephones more than the US Navy. So so the United States Navy uh, sort of got a black eye from the the attack on the USS Cole because uh, one of the main uh, takeaways from the subsequent investigations was the lack of communications. So the insurgents, uh, the terrorist bomb, uh, blew a hole right into a few compartments. And one of the, it just so happened that the compartments that were affected and, and blown to some of the rings and flooded were things like the communications compartment, where a lot of sh internal shipboard communications were, and also uh, where a lot of um, power switching stations were. So in short, what happened was the bomb blew a hole in the ship, and the ship lost power for about three weeks. So uh, three weeks afterwards, um, even, you know, weeks afterwards, the crew was still using, they were using during the disaster. And as far as, you know, several weeks after they were using handheld, uh, you know, like Motorola radios, right? Because all communications on the ship were, you know, essentially destroyed and they learned their lesson from that. And, Moving on to another more recent attack, the United States Navy again had learned had to learn their lesson when it comes to sound powered telephones. So, on the USS Fitzgerald during their you know collision incident on 17 June 2017, uh, they also learned the importance because when they uh, when that ship rammed them, they uh, one of the main things that went down were communications and power. It's almost like they hit uh, yet again one of the most vulnerable parts of the ship, which was where the sailors were sleeping, where you know the communications were routed through, and where power was routed through. So the ship lost power and lost communications, and they had you know people in trouble and all that kind of stuff. So it was a disaster scenario of one of the, of the worst kind, really. And once again, sound-powered telephones made their debut again because the ship had lost power, and the only things that worked were those handheld radios and the sound-powered telephones. So... The United States Navy has learned their lesson multiple times when it comes to sound-powered telephones on board ships. So it's definitely not a technology that is, you know, ancient or obsolete. So now we arrive at the phones that we use, and we actually use what is one of the least favorable in the you know collector community phones called the TA1. The TA1 is a sound-powered telephone, and like I said, it's not very favorable because it has no batteries. Most field telephones take actual batteries, but we use the TA1 because it doesn't require them, and we're not exactly concerned about... Um, transmitting over a long distance, right? The TA1 is also a much more lightweight than the TA312. It's a lot smaller, so you can put it in a lot more areas, and it's a lot, it looks on the surface of it a lot simpler to use. Um, it also has options right built right into the receiver of the, the phone to, you know, turn the ringer off so that if you're in like an observation post or something, you don't want, you know, a telephone ringing to give your position away. So it has a little visual 
visual dial that lets you know you're getting a phone call. So that's, you know, all of these criteria add up to make the TA1 a very good option for us. So what we, our normal setup and how these sort of sound powered telephones work is you take one telephone, you take another telephone, and you stretch a wire between them. It's a double stranded wire, so you have, you know, two terminals on each phone and, uh, you know, a double stranded wire between the two. And you'd think that it's basically just a really high tech version of the tin can and strings sort of toy that, you know, children use. And you'd be right. The only real difference is the quality of the phone call and the fact that the range on this particular phone from TA1 to TA1 is about four miles with standard, you know, field wire. Now, if you had the resources, money, time, effort, and well, really desire to stretch out more wire, you could upgrade to, like I mentioned, the uh, main field telephone that the U.S. forces have used since, really, Vietnam, which is the TA-312, uh, or the earlier variant, which is the TA-43, but they're essentially the same phone. Uh, the TA-312 is a little different. It, it takes batteries. Um, it still has a, a mechanical ringer and everything, but the difference is, is that once you put batteries in it to amplify the signal, now you're increasing your range to 24 miles, roughly, uh, with the same amount, with the same, you know, wire, standard WD-1 field wire. And that is, that is significant. See, a lot of people think that these field telephones, they go like 100 yards or so. No, no, these field telephones go, you know, miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. So those are the two sort of main U.S. phones that you can find on the Internet. Now, if you wanted to branch out, you could also find foreign phones. Like, for instance, uh, we use the, we use the uh, Swedish field telephones as well as the Russian field telephones here as well. They're essentially all the same technology. The only difference is the ringer devices on them are different. And, you know, they all take D batteries. So, you know, you can get rechargeable D batteries. They work with those as well. So if you wanted to, you know. Uh, have rechargeables that works as well and the battery drain is very 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 low um, you can talk for hours and hours and hours and you would not uh, you would not eat up the batteries in the, in the slightest um, I would say though that the foreign field telephones are a little bit uh, cheaper you can tend to get them pretty pretty cheap you can get uh, I think the Swedish variant is still on sportsman's guide um, as of late uh, 2020 um, and the Russian ones can be found all over eBay and things like that. You can find these on eBay. Just you know, search for a field telephone on eBay, and you'll be able to find a lot of these. And you know, I hate to quote a price on a video that's probably going to be around for you know many years, but right now the current price for these is um, a TA three one two costs around maybe a hundred bucks or so. Um, if you can find one, I think I think it's usually around eighty or so, and then there's about twenty bucks of shipping put on top of that. And then the Russian variant and the Swedish variant go from anywhere from, depending on the quality, you know, 50 bucks a piece to a hundred bucks a piece. Um, and sometimes you can get a set. So like what we did was we jumped on a, a surplus website and got a, uh, a couple of pairs of these Swedish telephones for, I think, 60 bucks for two. So they ended up being 30 bucks a piece with free shipping. So that was a great deal. Um, so yeah, you can find these field telephones everywhere. And it's, it's kind of interesting because like the Swedish phones that we have were actually developed, you know, slightly after World War II. So quite literally, we're using a military field telephone from, you know, a conflict from the 40s here in the year, you know, 2020. So very interesting. And uh, if you're a history buff, these would be, you know, kind of a more of a... Uh, uh, a cool thing for you to get, but also it has a very, very useful function. So before moving on, I did want to mention that um, the reason that the TA-1 is not very well liked is because it doesn't work with the TA-312. So the TA-1s were mostly used as like short range, you know, um, uh, phones for like observation posts, you know, just like a hundred yards that way, right? Put it to, you know, take a TA-1 with you and string out some wire, or they were used to test, uh, test connections between lines because they were very, you know, small and easy to carry. Um, but they do not work with the TA-312s. However, I have noticed, and some of our guys here have reported that they do um, work with field telephones from other countries. So the TA-312 will talk with every other country's field telephone. 
And the TA-1 will also work with every other f country's field telephone that we have found. Um, but they will not work together, which is interesting. The TA-312 and the TA-1 do not work together, which is interesting. But, you know, you can set up very interesting networks uh, that way. So I just wanted to point that out. If you're trying to buy a field telephone and you see a bunch of ones on eBay, I personally prefer the... Uh, the field telephones, field telephones from other countries because they tend to be a little bit cheaper. They tend to be, uh, and they work with the TA ones, which is what we use, you know, throughout our, you know, setup here. So another thing that's very fascinating, if you're into, you know, science and how radio waves work and how electricity works, is a concept that was come up with during World War One. And you got to remember, during World War One, there really wasn't anything, you know, like uh, double-stranded wire. It literally it was wire, which was covered with rubber, if you're lucky, or cloth in most cases. You know, we're going back to the very beginning of the electrical field, really. So what they figured out was normally you have a field telephone in this first location and you have a field, lo a field telephone located in another location and you need two wires to string between them. So one wire per terminal uh, for the field telephones to complete the circuit. You can't just do it with one wire. So what they figured out was that you could actually get rid of that second wire and instead of the second wire, you could actually use the Earth's crust as a return wire. So this is called Earth return technology. And what soldiers would do is they would take either specially made stakes made for this, or they would take their bayonet, which is uh, very common as well, and they would hook one lead to the bayonet and shove it in the ground. And the other guy at the other end of the line would do the same thing. So that way you only had to stretch one strand of wire. And this also meant that you could d effectively double the length of wire that you had because you only needed one wire between points. You could take the that second strand and tie, you know, um, sort of tie it together because back in the day, rows, wires were actually tied with knots. They weren't actually, you know, twisted together like normal stranded wire we have today. They're actually tied together like string. And uh, you could effectively double the range. And uh, the way this would work is the signal would go, um, this is the animation here is kind of backwards on the YouTube video. Sorry for those of you who are watching, but uh, the... Um, the signal would actually go down the line and be returned via the uh, ground, uh, the stake in the ground. So it actually works. We've tried this out um, here in the shop, and most importantly, we've tried it out using magnet wire. Now, magnet wire is fascinating because this is a, a brand new technology that, uh, well, it's not really brand new, but it's a you know we now in you know the 21st century have the capability of producing really really thin wire, you know thinner than a sixteenth of an inch wire, and we can put a lot of it on a spool. So. You know, like right here, I've got a spool of wire, which is not even sold by length. It's sold by weight. Um, but it just so happens that it weighs about two pounds, and it is a little over a mile of wire. That's amazing. You know, and it's a small little, you know, four-inch roll of wire. So literally, I can put a TA-1 in my backpack. I can put a little over a mile of wire in my backpack, and I could take my, you know, bayonet or knife, and that would be the connection. So literally all I would have to do is hop on the back of a motorcycle or something like that, or even just run and w or walk, you know, spooling out this single strand of really, really thin wire if I had to, right? And uh, once I get to the end, I don't need to do it again to string that second wire. I could, you know, just stick a stake in the ground and have the other guy do it on the other end of the line. And there's my connection. So that's a fascinating technology. Now, of course, there are downsides. It's not extremely long range. We're talking just, you know, a couple of miles here, not, you know, 10 and 20 miles like on some other field telephones. And, of course, it doesn't work in sand. So if there's a patch of sand, like a patch of sandy ground between you but you know, between you know, and the other station, it's not going to work. You have to bridge over it, which, you know, you can go look up vintage, uh, you know, um, handbooks and, and training manuals on how to do this. But, uh, yeah, it's a fascinating technology that not a lot of people know about. And this is, you know, oh, you know like I said, over 100 years old, which is just a fascinating part of it. 
and you know like here like we were showing on, on the youtube video for those of you watching us on youtube um you know the, the soldiers using bayonets is very very was very very common um it, you know even these are german soldiers and the, the british soldiers invented it so it's very very interesting that this old uh technology is still useful today and not just useful but like really useful in the concept of or in the context of what we're dealing with in society today now of course it would not be a sort of s2 underground video without talking about the cons of this product right there there is a reason that you know militaries don't use field telephones anymore for the most part a lot of uh, interestingly enough a lot of armies and militaries in europe still do for like guard shacks and things like that but there's a reason we don't send out dudes like you know on the slide here with you know backpacks of reels of wire it's because it's horrifically dangerous um in a war in a wartime scenario your wire layer is a huge huge target because communications are always an issue and he's usually got a pretty good uh, identifying feature of this big spool of wire on his back for you to you know easily be shot at so you know laying wire in a combat scenario is extraordinarily dangerous which is why we got away from it when it comes to you know once um radio technology got to the point of where it was able to be secured and long distance and reliable we, you know wire uh, field telephone sort of went away and, you know, put in context of, you know, the civilian, you know, market, you know, wire laying is dangerous in wartime, but it's suspicious in peacetime. You know, uh, in some areas, you're not going to be able to lay wire without some neighbor, you know, who isn't in on what's going on, you know, gets, you know, call either calls the police on you or something like that. Now, for those of you who live in a more rural area, not so much a concern, but for, for our guys that live in cities, eh, this is going to be kind of a harder thing to do because you can't exactly, you know, lay wire over roads or anything like that. You have to lay them through culverts and things like that. So depending on your scenario, this might not be an option at all. Um, uh, especially running wire outside your house. Now you could run a, a line, f you know, inside your house, you know, from your front door to your back door all day long, and nobody, nobody would really care or even know about it. But if you're trying to do it outside, it's a little bit more of a concern. So um, just keep that in mind: is that it's not necessarily a, a foolproof option for a lot of people. But it is just another piece of the puzzle. So if this is your, you know, ideal communications network, um, you know, field telephones and you know, laying wire for field telephones definitely has a place. Um, and in our scenario here, we're talking about neighbor to neighbor communication, right? And it's not just something that, you know, a couple of your neighbors can do. If you have a lot of neighbors, if you are lucky enough to live in an area where you're on very good terms, very friend, you know, very friendly with your neighbors, um, then you might have a better option. You might be able to create a lot more, a lot more of a community preparedness mindset, right? So you could have, you know, a neighbor who has like this, you know, on this slide here, a, a listening post, observation post, an LPOP, right, in their yeah. attic, which is nothing more than just a, uh, a, 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 a so, you know, a chair at a window, right? It doesn't have to be anything sp specific or, you know, grandiose, right? You could just have this sort of LPOP there, which covers, you know, this part of the road. And then, you know, another neighbor at the other end of the street could have the same thing facing the other way. So you monitor traffic in and out of your area if an emergency occurs. Uh, you could also have a, a house with that has, you know, dedicated supplies or, you know, maybe a community building where everybody, you know, which is a shelter for people, right? You could also have, you know, your local ham radio operator because every community, especially in a rural area, has got that one guy who loves ham radio and he's got those gigantic antennas. And that guy is probably going to know what the heck is going on um, a lot more, uh, a lot sooner than a lot of other people might in your community. You might have a neighbor or, you know, who's maybe elderly or a shut in and, and can't, uh, can't provide for themselves so much that they might need some assistance during an emergency. You also might have a neighbor who has, you know, like a, a child with diabetes or something like that and therefore needs their insulin to be refrigerated. You know, things like that. Um, can be very, very helpful to have them, you know, all connected on a network. You know, if you want to be an asset to your community, this can be very, very helpful. 
And if you're saying, if you're thinking, well, you know, there's ways to do that. You can have, you know, handheld radios that you can give to all your neighbors and things like that. And that's good. You know, you can go out, you know, with like your cert team and distribute things. You know, you can go door to door, make sure your neighbors are okay. That is perfect. But what we're finding out in 2020 and what we're going to be, you know, learning the hard way in 2021 is that we might not have the luxury of leaving our own home. Uh, we might not have the luxury of going out and helping our neighbors because we've got either private citizens going out there and and, and sort of you know goon squatting each other up uh, for not wearing masks on sidewalks or things like that. We might have you know like in the case of Australia, the military and police literally locking people in their own homes and not letting them out without special permits. Um, th- you know this is not being pessimistic. This is being realistic as to what might happen in the United States. So if you take the time to create your network ahead of time, you could have a pretty good system of community watch, a system that is able to take care of anyone moving in and around your neighborhood and nobody has to leave their homes to do so. So that is a, a, a good thing to have. You always want a community watch system to be as effective as it as it can be. And if you set up a good party line for all this, you could even have, you know, community uh, community messages, you know, you could even hold church services over a field telephone wire from house to house to house. Um, and no one would ever know about it. No one could spy on you. No, uh, no technology like, you know, FaceTime or, or, um, Zoom is going to be spying on you and recording what you say. It's all your own network because you created the network and it's your infrastructure. So that's why we wanted to talk about field telephones because it's a very vital communications method. It might not work for everybody, but it's sure going to work for some. And we wanted to bring it up and mention it because we think that not a whole lot of people um, know about this technology and talk about it. So that's why we wanted to talk about it today. So let us know what you think. Um, make sure that you you know like, comment, subscribe. Uh, check out our other content. Uh, we're going to host this video on our uh, LBRY page, our library page, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, so that it doesn't get censored or taken down. We're also going to take the audio from this and put it on our podcast for those of you who like our podcast. And we will also have lots more resources on our key base, so join the discussion there if you want to learn more um, about this sort of technology. So thank you for tuning in to this, uh, to this episode, and we will see you next time. And always remember to find the shade. That's to actual out.